No? Okay. And we're back. So this is our body defences unit. Our body defences unit. So everything we're going to be looking at in this particular session has got everything to do with body defences. Okay? But first of all, we're going to start off by describing what are the types of things that are trying to get in. So before we look at how we keep them out, let's examine the things that are trying to physically get into our bodies, because they have to get into our bodies to make us ill. Okay? Anything that tries to get into our bodies that makes us ill, we tend to call a pathogen. Have people heard of pathogens before? Yes. Is that a word that people are familiar with? Yes, Dave. Say yes, Dave. Yes, Dave. Yes, Dave. Thank you very much. Okay. Does anybody know what a pathogen is? You probably know examples of pathogens, but how would you define a pathogen? What would you say a pathogen was if you had to explain it to somebody else? It's a type of bacteria. Bacteria is a great example of a pathogen, but not all bacteria make us ill. So can we refine our answer? What do you think a pathogen is? We have good and bad bacteria. So is a pathogen a good or a bad bacteria? It's bad. A pathogen is a bad bacteria because overall pathogens make us Ill. ill. So in this session we are going to look at what is the definition of a pathogen. We're going to look at various pathogens, things that can make us ill. Then we're going to look at some diseases they cause, and also we're going to look at how they get into our bodies. Okay, how they actually get into our bodies. Let's start with the easiest thing first. What is a pathogen? The very simplest definition of a pathogen is any microorganism that can cause disease. That's the very simplest definition of a pathogen. Personally, I don't quite like that one, and you'll see why in a second. But now we're kind of differentiate between what we were talking about before. A pathogen can be a bacteria, but it's only a pathogen when that bacteria has the ability to cause a disease. Because I think we all know that we have good and bad bacteria. So when we're talking about pathogens, we would be talking about a bacteria that has the ability to make us ill, that causes a disease. Personally, I prefer this definition of a pathogen. A pathogen is a microorganism that has the potential to cause a disease. Because right here and now, I can guarantee you that we are surrounded by pathogens, things that have the potential to cause us a disease. But that potential is never realised because they never technically get into our bodies. So we could have a pathogen on this work surface here. That has the potential to cause me a disease. But unless that pathogen actually gets into my body, it always has the potential to cause a disease, but it hasn't caused me a disease because it hasn't technically got in. So I kind of want you to think of pathogens as microorganisms, small organisms, that have the potential to cause us a disease. Because they always have that potential to cause us a disease, even if they haven't technically broken into our bodies yet. Now, infection and disease. These are two words that we use in English language, which we tend to use, we tend to use as the same thing. They're not the same thing. An infection is when one of those microorganisms, those pathogens, has actually broken into our bodies and is now starting to colonize. What do you think I mean by colonize? Create more. Develop. Okay. But as yet, they are not causing the body any harm. In other words, that little collection of microorganisms that are pathogens are starting to divide, but at the moment, they are not causing us a massive amount of harm. It is only when the pathogens reach sufficient numbers where they start to damage our cells that we start to get the symptoms of a disease. So when they damage, we get disease. 
when they infect us, they infect us, but we as yet do not show any symptoms of a disease. You all know this. You all know this. Because you all know that something as simple as a common cold has what we call an incubatory period, don't you? In other words, that you are potentially contagious, but you show no symptoms of that disease yet. So basically, you could catch the cold virus, the influenza virus, today, and it would infect you. It would start to colonise in parts of your lungs, but you wouldn't even know that was happening yet. The symptoms and the damage come in round about two to three days' time, when it's grown sufficiently in numbers and quantity to cause you physical harm and therefore damage. So basically, infection precedes damage. Damage is disease. Do people get that distinction between the two? Okay? They get in, they infect you, and as that infection grows, eventually it leads to damage. It's only when we get damage in our bodies that we get the symptoms of the disease. Which is why people can get on an aeroplane and be contagious because they have been infected, but they don't even know that they're ill yet. They are asymptomatic. They show no signs of damage, no signs of disease, but they are still capable of transmitting the pathogen. That is technically what is happening with coronavirus. People are becoming infected and are showing very, very few symptoms, but they're still capable of moving that virus around before they even know that they are technically ill. So people come down happy with the definition of a pathogen now. Anything that is uber, uber small, a microorganism, that has the ability to cause us harm. Okay, the potential to cause us harm. And we have quite a few examples of microorganisms that can cause us harm. We have ones that you have probably heard of here. Has everybody here heard of bacteria? Yeah. Say yes, Dave. Yes, yes, Thank you very much. Okay. What I want to avoid in these sessions is for you to go away thinking that bacteria are all bad for you, because they are not. Have you all heard of the bacteria called E. coli? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes? Say yes, Dave. Yes, Dave. Okay. Is E. coli good or bad? Bad. Good and bad. There are around 500 different species of E. coli. Not all of them are bad. Not all of them are bad. Some of them are bad. And some can cause us awful problems, but not all of them are bad. Has everybody heard of a virus? Say yes, Dave. Yes, Dave. Okay. A virus is still considered, although there are arguments going on, to be a non-living thing. I have to say that most, if not all, viral particles are what we might call cellular parasites. They have to break into one of your cells, take it over, in order to divide themselves and make more virus particles. So you can kind of think at this level that viruses are exclusively bad. Okay? So bacteria, are they bad, good and bad, or just good? What are they? They are, they are good and bad. Viruses tend to be just bad. Okay, just bad. Has anybody heard of that word before? Protozoa? Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar? Okay. Has everybody heard of malaria? Yeah. Okay. Malaria is a parasite, a small parasite that basically gets into your bloodstream and also into your liver. And I have to say, has anybody here, any, has anybody had malaria, by the way? Okay. It's incredibly difficult to get rid of because it is an incredibly successful parasite. It hides in your body and people often get different bouts of malaria over time. It can come back again. A protozoa is a very small microorganism. It is much bigger than both of these, but basically again, it is a pathogen because it is small and it can cause a disease. And finally, I am sure people have heard of fungi. Everybody heard of fungi? Yeah. Say yes, Dave. Yeah. Okay, fungi. Anybody here ever, has anybody here ever suffered from athlete's foot? 
No. no. Have you? Right. That's a fungi that basically grows on you. What does it tend to grow? Athlete's foot. <laughs> on your feet, okay? And especially between your toes. And although we smile about it, okay, it can become incredibly painful once the skin starts to break down. Okay. Brilliant. So, in general, guys, in general, what I'm looking for is, once you've defined what your pathogen is, give you the definition, what is an infection, what is a disease, what is a pathogen, I'd like you to give me an example, a very quick example, of what a pathogen might look like, okay, for your report. Brilliant. So, what does it take to be a successful pathogen? Okay, and again, this is kind of important. This is the blueprint for all pathogens, okay? If you're going to be successful as a pathogen, you need to do certain things. First of all, numero uno, you need to colonize the host, meaning you. In other words, they need to get in and they need to divide. They need to find what we call a compatible, okay, niche where they will get nutrients. In other words, they want to find somewhere where they can find food. Easy peasy. In other words, they want to live inside you where they can actually find some food. Because you don't want them there, you are looking for them. So what they need to do is hide. So they want to hide from your defences. They want to try and get round your defence systems. They don't want to be detected. So they try and hide from your body's defences. Whilst they're in there, they want to have a good time. So they want to replicate. They want to divide. They want to make more pathogens just like them. And finally, just like teenagers, when they get old enough, you want them gone. You just want them gone. Get out of my house. You lived here for so long. You've never done your laundry. You've never done anything. You've never even cooked a meal. It's about time you went, okay, and lived somewhere else on your own for a while, okay? Ooh, okay. So eventually, what pathogens want to do is they want to leave me, and they want to infect other hosts. In other words, they then want to leave the host, me, and find their way into some new home, just like a teenager. In the honest hope that they don't just come boomeranging back again, you know, when they want to do their washing, or boomerang back because they can't pay the rent, or boomerang back, how long have I got? Because this has happened to me time and time again. Okay. But what I want to take away from this slide is that to be successful, and hundreds of thousands of pathogens are, they are brilliant at what they do. Do not be confused because they are tiny. Do not be confused because they are often called simplified versions of a human cell. They are brilliant at what they do. Brilliant at what they do. So, this will kind of, I just want to put this one in, just so as you lodge it away in here. What makes us feel ill? And that answer might surprise you, because we're going to talk about our immune system in a little bit more detail. Has everybody heard of that word inflammation? Yeah. What do you understand by that word inflammation? If something is inflamed, what is it? What does it look like? It's, it is swollen, it is red. Okay. What tends to form on the top sometimes? Something beginning with P. Pus. Okay. Swollen, red. Is it painful? Yes. Yeah. All of those things that you have just described are not the direct result of the pathogen. They are your immune system reacting to the pathogen. Inflammation is part of your immune system's response to get rid of the pathogen. So that pain, that sense of it being swollen, that sense of it being red, all of those things are not down to the pathogen, they're down to your immune system trying to battle the pathogen. And we call them inflammation, and we're going to return to that in a later topic. Everybody happy with that so far? Yeah. You're doing really well. Doing really well. So, let's have a look, very briefly, 
at some of our more common pathogens. Boom. Up and close and personal, say hello to Mr. and Mrs. Streptococcus pyrogens, the sore throat. This is a bacteria, okay? Each of these is a tiny little ball, all joined together in a long, long chain. Bacteria, guys, by the way, guys, bacteria are considered to be living things because they can divide on their own, okay? Say that again, please. No, 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 go on. Are they living? Organisms. Yes, they are. Yeah, they are living organisms. Bacteria are living organisms. Um, the fungi is a living organism. The protozoa is a living organism. It's only the virus that's considered not to be living. But good question. Great question. Say hello to Mr. and Mrs. Measles. Okay? Kind of looks like a malformed Brussels sprout. Okay? So we'll come back to these little things that you see here. All of these little things that you see on the surface of this measles virus, these are the points, guys, like the Velcro, that will attach themselves to our cells. Okay? Now, let me just go back a stage and just put this one back up. I just want to give you a sense of scale. Okay? This is a bacteria. Okay? Let me draw it larger. So let's say that's the bacteria. A viral particle will be that big. So viruses are incredibly small, significantly smaller than a bacteria. People are okay with that's a sense of scale. Super duper. Say hello. Sorry, is that dot the virus? Yeah, so the dot, that dot in terms of in terms of scale will be the virus. Teeny tiny in comparison to a bacteria. And by the way, a bacteria is significantly smaller than one of our cells. So our, our cells will be the size of the board. A bacteria is that big, a virus is that big. So it's, you get the idea of the sense of scale. To to. Brilliant. This is athlete's foot, close up and personal. This is the stuff that is growing in between your toes. Or the stuff that is growing in between your nails. Anybody had a nail infection, a fungal nail infection? You always know if you've got a fungal nail infection because all of a sudden your nail feels much, much thicker and it goes significantly darker. And what's happening is all of this fungus is basically growing into your nail. They're a bugger to get rid of I've nail infections. My friend always bites the side of the skin and it creates, yeah, it creates a massive bump on it. Awful. It takes weeks to get rid of a, a fungal infection in a nail because nails grow so slowly. And finally, here is a protozoa. Trypanosome. This one is, it looks like a tiny little banana, okay? It's actually a little tiny worm. You can kind of think of it as a tiny worm that's actually in your bloodstream. Um, this is kind of like on a similar scale. So this is a red blood cell, so you can see how small this parasitic worm is. This parasitic worm is very prevalent in parts of um, Africa and causes sleeping sickness. Malaria is a similar kind of thing. It's a microorganism, it's a protozoa. It's actually a living thing. These things literally wriggle around inside your bloodstream. You can. You can. Malaria is particularly, well, the, the vector for malaria is, of course, the mosquito, and mosquitoes tend to live near water. Yeah. Brilliant. Now, now, really cool bit. Now we've talked about pathogens. Pathogens have the potential to cause disease and harm. There are only, would you believe, four ways, only four ways in which a pathogen can technically get into our bodies. Four ways. That's it. So they are limited to only four what we call portals of entry, meaning gateways into our body. Number one, they can get in through your respiratory tract, like the influenza virus, like COVID. They can get in through your gastrointestinal tract, like cholera. They can get into your urogenital tract, like E. coli would for uh, and chlamydia, for example, would get in through your urogenital tract. Or they can actually get in through breaks in your skin, like tetanus. 
So the one thing about this slide, guys, and what we're going on to look at in more detail, is each of these in a bit more detail, is that technically there are only four ways in which a pathogen can actually get into your body. Through your respiratory tract, through your digestive tract, through your urogenital tract, or through a break in the skin. There's only four ways in which they can get it. The second one down, gastrointestinal, yeah. cholera, mm -hmm. cholera, and we're going to look at those in a bit more detail right now. So let's talk about influenza, and while we're talking about influenza, we could also use COVID as an example of this. Okay. Influenza, like COVID, is a virus. That virus has to be inhaled and it has to go through your mouth and into your lungs before it can cause a problem. So in other words, this particular virus, influenza, if this got into a cut in your skin, it would not cause a cold. If this influenza virus got into your urogenital tract, it would not cause a cold. If this virus got into your like, digestive tract, your urogenital tract, or a break in the skin, it would not cause a cold. It can only cause a cold, influenza, if it actually gets into your lungs. Viruses and bacteria and pathogens are very, very specific about the routes at which they actually come in. You could swallow influenza and you would not get flu. It has to get into your lungs. These viral particles are pre-programmed only to lock on to certain cells in your body. If they do not lock on to those cells, they will not cause you a problem. So influenza is pre-programmed. It can only physically bind, lock on to cells that are in your lungs. That's it. It can't bind to any other cells in your body, only the ones in your lungs. And it has, for want of a better word, Velcro on the outside of it. And that Velcro sticks, basically, to the cells in your lungs. It's like a binding material. If that is wrong, if those spikes don't fit that cell, it will not bind. So it's very, very specific. Once those spikes have attached to the cells in your lungs, it fools those cells into thinking that this is something the cell wants. And so the cell allows it to enter. Once it's entered the cell, the viral particle then fools your cell and gets your cell to make more viral particles. That's what happens. It literally fools your cells to make more viral particles. And eventually, the cell becomes so full of viral particles, it literally bursts open. And all those viral particles then go in search of their own cells to basically infect and that is how that virus spreads throughout your lungs, damaging the cells in your lungs, which is why things like this lead to such terrible problems inside your lungs, which is why we have COVID now, which causes that massive respiratory problem in terms of breathing, because you are damaging the internal surface of your lungs, and actually your own immune system response compounds the problem, as we'll see later on. So your lungs become very irritated, the lining becomes very inflamed, and as a result of that, you also get the flu, an aching sense, and a fever, and everything else that goes around with that. But some of those symptoms that you experience is your immune system responding to that particular virus. So viral particles, great example, influenza, breaking into your lungs. Portal number one. Portal number two, your gastrointestinal tract. A great example of a bacteria that utilizes this one is cholera. Cholera is a killer disease. Is a killer disease. It can kill people, particularly children and particularly elderly people, very, very quickly. Does anybody know why people will die from cholera? What is it that actually causes death with cholera? Does anybody know? Bacteria. It is bacteria. 
But what, what is the actual cause of death in the end? It's actually... Anybody? Lots of fluids? Yeah. It's actually dehydration. You die because you become chronically dehydrated because what cholera does is cholera effectively binds to your small intestines. Again, it has to get into your small intestines before it produces its effect. Once in there, it reverses the flow of water. So instead of water being absorbed from your small intestine, now your, the water from your body leaks into your small intestine, which means you then start to pass huge volumes of water. Diarrhea. When anybody mentions poo in the UK, right, it's often a source of comedic entertainment. And often diarrhea isn't really thought of as something which is serious. Let me reframe your knowledge of diarrhea. With cholera, you can lose 15 to 20 litres of fluid a day, which is not sustainable. You cannot get enough water into your body to cope with the amount that is actually coming out in diarrhea, which means your blood becomes increasingly thick. You literally dehydrate to death. And it can happen between 24 to 48 hours. It takes a while for the infection to become the disease, but once you have got the disease, 24 to 48 hours, and you literally could be dead. There are terrible scenes um, around the world in sub-Saharan Africa where you see children who are on IV drips and they can't get enough fluid into those children because it's coming out the other end quicker than they can get it in. So diarrhea is a very, very dangerous condition. It's not dangerous in this country, but in parts of, in parts of Africa, for example, um, Somalia, uh, parts of sub-Saharan Africa, Egypt, for example, Malawi. It can be a terrible disease, and often it's associated with contaminated water. Cholera, we often refer to it as the fetal, sorry, the oral to fetal root. Very often people get cholera because the water they have drunk, or the water that has been used to wash food or plates or anything else in, is contaminated with cholera bacteria. And that cholera bacteria has come from the feces of somebody who has been infected with cholera. So in Haiti, one of the poorest countries in the world, the United Nations went in after the tsunami. One of the members of the United Nations that went in, unbeknowing to anybody else, had cholera but was asymptomatic. The tsunami had completely devastated all the infrastructure in Haiti, which meant that everything was virtually underwater. This United Nations camp set up near a major river that led downstream into a town. They dug, as they should have done, they dug a cesspit in which all their waste material would be thrown but they dug it too close to the river. The water table between where the cesspit was and the river basically meant that what was going into that cesspit basically ended up going into the river. The one individual that had cholera, whose poo was going into that cesspit, the cholera leached into the river, went downstream where everybody was using the water to bathe, and drink, feed children, and everything else. 10,000 people died. 10,000 people died because of that. One person, one single, we traced it back, one single person caused that. Not intentional, I hasten to add, but diarrhea, incredibly serious. Okay. Portal number two. Portal number three, cystitis. Now, cystitis is a very common condition for women. I'm not going to say hands up if you've had cystitis, okay? But it is a particularly common condition for women. However, 
it is not a very common condition for me, Bill. Okay? Because cystitis is not a disease that you catch from anybody but yourself. Cystitis has got everything down to the way in which women, the proximity, shall we say, between two openings in ladies. This opening that you poo through and this opening that you wee through. In men, the proximity, the distance, is significantly greater, which means it's very unlikely that men will ever get cystitis. Cystitis is often caused by the fact that the bacteria that is coming out in your poo gets into the opening that you urinate from. And that opening then allows that bacteria to go up towards your bladder and you get cystitis. So you don't catch it from something else like cholera or influenza. Very often cystitis is a perfect example of a condition, a disease, where you actually catch those bacteria from yourself. From yourself. And it is all down to that one. It's all down to the proximity of where you would wee from and poo from in women is much closer than it is in men. So men tend not to suffer from cystitis in the same way that women do. Do children suffer from that by the way? Babies do. You bet because, uh, because of wiping. Yeah. And finally, before we take a break, come on down to awful number four. Breaks of the skin. Breaks of the skin. Perfect example is tetanus. Has everybody heard of tetanus before? Yeah. Is tetanus serious? Yes. Absolutely is. Does anybody know if you contract tetanus, okay, if you contract tetanus, you have an idea of how serious it is, this is how serious it is, heads you live, tails you die. 50-50. 50-50, if you contract tetanus. Oh, I do. <laughs> tetanus is a bacteria that you find in soil. It's a natural bacteria. It's happy in soil. You very often find it in dog species as well. But it lives in soil. It's not the actual tetanus bacteria, but what we call the endospores, the little floating bodies from the bacteria that causes a problem. So if you get a cut, and if those little endospores from the bacteria get into that cut, then all of a sudden you have got a major fucking problem. Because those little spores block neurotransmitters that go to your muscles. What does that mean? Well, it starts off because people have often heard of tetanus being locked jaw. People have heard of locked jaw before? Mm -hmm. That is the least of your bloody problems. As well as locked jaw, the muscles will now uncontrollably go into contractions. You will literally find patients arching off the bed. The contractions of their muscles are so strong that in some cases they will break bones because the muscles contract so much. But again, that's not going to kill you. What's going to kill you with tetanus is that your respiratory model, model models, your respiratory muscles, become paralysed, and you die because you cannot breathe. You die through asphyxiation. I have only known one person, a guy called, what's his name, who was a student here four years ago, and he contracted tetanus gardening. He had an open wound, that was it, and he managed to get those endospores in that wound. He can't remember the first five days in hospital because he was on life support. He was one of the 50% that came out the other end. So when we were talking about it, he could really put it into context. He was in ICU for five days while they were pumping him full of neuromuscular blockers to try and stop the contractions. They were pumping him full of sedatives. He was in an induced coma and he was being artificially respirated because he could not breathe. Five days, a complete blur. 
It was only when they lifted him out of the coma on day six that he realized he was actually in hospital. He had no memory of anything leading up to it at all. Tetanus, incredibly serious. We're going to close this PowerPoint down with one piece of advice. If you get a cut, if any of your children or family members get a cut and there is soil in it and they have not had a tetanus vaccination in the last few years, you go to a and &E. And they will not refuse you a tetanus vaccination because they know, they know how important and how quickly this can come on. Now, we'll come on to this because that tetanus vaccination that you are given is not, repeat, not going to give you lifelong immunity. It will only give you immunity for a few years. If you ever have any doubt and you go to hospital with a family member and say, oh, were they vaccinated with tetanus within the last five years? You say no if you are not sure. Because it's better to err on the side of caution and say, no, we haven't had it. Boom, let's have one now. That tetanus vaccination will protect you almost immediately from tetanus. But it will not give you what we call lifelong immunity. And we'll explain those terms in later lessons. So, just to recap, does everybody know what a pathogen is? Yes. Somebody say yes, Dave. Yes. Okay. Can anybody tell me what a pathogen is? A pathogen is... Come on, come on, come on. What is potentially dangerous? It's potentially dangerous. Okay, can anybody name one of the four common types of pathogen? Fungi. Fungi. I have fungi from fame. Oh, nice alliteration. Fungi from fame. Okay. We have a virus. We have a bacteria. Protozoa. In other words, a small microorganism. Like the okay. How many portals of entry are there into our body? Four. Can anybody name one? Breaks in the skin. Breaks in the skin. I've got one. Respiratory system from Faye, I've got two. Oral cavity, gastrointestinal tract, cholera, three. Urogenital tract. Example of? What was the example for urogenital tract? Cystitis was number four. So is everybody happy with what a pathogen is? Is everybody happy about the portals of entry? For the piece of work that you do, you have to define the pathogen. You have to tell me what is a successful pathogen. You have to then give me examples of pathogens. Just a few. A few examples of a virus, a few examples of a bacteria. And then you have to tell me the four portals of entry. Is everybody happy with that? Can you say that again, sorry? You have to tell me what a pathogen is. You have to tell me what creates a successful pathogen. You have to tell me what is the difference between an infection and a disease. You have to give me a few examples of what a different pathogen is. In other words, give me a few examples of a virus, give me a few examples of a bacteria, give me a few examples of a protozoa, just two and give me a couple of examples of fungal infection. And then finally, you have to give me the four portals of entry and a pathogen, a specific pathogen, that utilizes that portal of entry to get into your body. Bish bash bosh, chicken dinner, it's a win. So we are back. And we're still talking about body defenses. And we say body defenses, body defenses. Say the meaning and feeling. Well, I know it's later in the afternoon. Say it again for me. Thank you, Paris. We are back with body defences. Just before we go back with body defences, give me the definition of a pathogen. A pathogen is a microorganism that has the potential to. Ooh, check out the brain on brand. No, you're not going to say it. Now. So, a pathogen is something that has the potential to cause a disease. Pathogens can get into the body through how many different routes? Four. Four. Thank you very much. Can anybody remember one route? Gastrointestinal. Puncture in the skin. Breathing in. Respiratory. And 
urogenitals. There's only four ways in which a pathogen can get into you. Only four ways it can get into you. So well done. Well done. Now we're going to talk about bacteria that are not necessarily, repeat, not necessarily going to cause you harm. They are cooking. <laughs> Yakos. They are called resident bacteria because from the moment you are born, you are covered in these little buggers and they tend not to cause you a problem at all. In fact, we give them residency status because as you will see in the presentation, many of the bacteria that live in us and on us actually do things which are good for us. Okay? Are good for us. I will point out something which is really important. Two little words that you need to think of because it's really important for the piece of work you do for me, which are ones which are called opportunistic pathogens. Watch out for that word. I'll remind you of it when we get to it in the presentation. So, what are resident bacteria? Sometimes you will see them called resident flora. In fact, your resident bacteria are unique to you. Forensically now, we know that at a crime scene, you will leave behind your DNA and you will leave behind your fingerprints and now we know that you will leave behind your resident flora. The profile of your resident flora is unique to you. The proportions of the bacteria that are on your skin surface is quite unique to you. And trust me, you are laced with bacteria on your skin. They are all over you, literally all over you. However, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> However, However, there are certain parts of the body that we do not repeat, we do not allow your resident bacteria to live. These areas we call axenic which is just here. Which literally means they are sterile. You do not allow these bacteria to live in these areas. You do not allow them to live in your body cavity, deep down in your lungs. You do not allow them to live in your central nervous system. You do not allow them in your circulatory system. You do not allow them in what we call your upper urogenital regions. That means the tubes that go from your bladder to your kidneys. You do not allow bacteria in any of those areas at all. Right now, in every single one of us, those areas are kept squeaky and clean. Nothing lives in those areas at all. If it did, you would have a major problem. Does anybody know what happens when we get bacteria in our central nervous system in the fluid? You all know this. Bacterial begins with an M. Bacterial meningitis. Does anybody know if you get bacteria in your bloodstream, begins with an S, it's an absolute killer. Sepsis. So these areas, we keep squeaky, polished, no entry allowed, I don't care if you're good, you are not coming in here, clean. Axenic areas, no bacteria allowed, like going into a club, you got trainers on that? Boom, you're not allowed in, you're not allowed, everybody's out, you don't allow them in these areas. Beautiful. However, we do give bacteria a right to live on us in other areas in your body. So, you are literally crawling with bacteria. Your skin is smothered in the damp things, and they colonize your skin. They will also colonize your mucous membranes in your upper respiratory system, meaning your throat, and also in your major airway going down into your lungs. We do allow them in the lower bit of your urogenital system, and we definitely allow them to live in your large intestine, in your digestive tract. These bacteria do not harm you. They do not harm you. And in fact, as we will see, they do absolutely everything other than harm you. 
In fact, they provide you with a number of significant benefits. So don't think of these bacteria living on your skin or in your digestive system as causing you a problem, because in the majority of cases, they never will. In fact, they would cause more of a problem if they weren't there, if they actually weren't there. Okay, well look. How do we know what the benefits are from these resident bacteria? Because back in the day, quite a long time ago, some mad buffet of a scientist decided that they would breed mice. But these mice were bred so they were completely and utterly 100% bacteria free. They had no bacteria living in them, they had no bacteria living on them, and they were kept in 100% sterile conditions. So in other words, they had never met and never had any bacteria living in them or on them. Now, you say that they're not happy, they're perfectly happy, as long as they were kept in a sterile area. What do you think the mad scientists then did? Correct. The mad scientist <laughs> then put them in a non-sterile area and watched what happened. In other words, what was the impact of taking an animal that had no bacteria living in it or on it and then putting it in an environment where bacteria were naturally everywhere? What did they find these uh, particular mice were deficient in? They found that actually a lot of these sterile mice were not making there weren't many vitamins. They had vitamin deficiencies. They found that these mice that were kept in sterile conditions were much more susceptible to diseases than mice that actually had lived in an environment where there were bacteria present. They found that their immune systems were very underdeveloped. And they found that there was a lack of what we call natural antibody or natural immunity to bacteria. So, do you think from this particular study that they inferred that bacteria, your natural bacteria, give you a benefit? Yes, they absolutely did. They said your natural bacteria must give you a benefit because these mice that have no natural bacteria are all weakened by this. So our natural bacteria must give us some added benefits. So what are these benefits? Benefit number one, your natural bacteria make stuff for you. Well, that's not technically true. They make stuff for themselves, but they make so much stuff for themselves, they actually allow you to absorb the excess that they make. <coughs> A lot of the bacteria that you have working in your gut, in your large intestine right now, are making vitamin K. You, sometimes. And that vitamin K, does anybody know what vitamin K is critical for? For? Bing, check out the brain on that. That's almost worth the sticker. That is brilliant, yes. Vitamin K is used for clotting of the blood. We get a lot of our vitamin K from the bacteria that live in our large intestine that make vitamin K for themselves, but they make a big full of it, which means effectively a lot of the excess that they make we absorb. Is that a good thing? Yes, Dave. Yes, Dave. Does anybody lose in that relationship? No. no. It's a win-win, isn't it? It's a complete win-win. They get all the food, the right temperature, a nice place to live, Sky TV, I well, don't get that, but you get the idea. They have a lovely environment, they make vitamin K, any excess that they make, you can have for free, as long as we can live here for free. Quid pro quo, thank you very much, chicken dinner, it's a winner, I'll live here. Vish bosh, bosh, thank you. Benefit number two. Your normal bacteria, even though they are not going to harm you, will very gently stimulate your immune system. And what we believe is happening with that is that those bacteria that don't harm you, they will increase your immunity to the bacteria that will harm you. 
In other words, there's kind of a cross reaction so that they gently stimulate your immune system. So that when you do come into contact with pathogens, you respond to them much more quickly. That's kind of a good thing, isn't it? Say yes, Dave. Yes, Say it with feeling. Yes, Shout it loud and proud. Yes, 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 <laughs> so, so it's a good thing. It's a really good thing. Again, it's a win-win. It's a win-win. You might notice I missed that benefit number three. So we move straight through to benefit number four, which I think is a major benefit. Some of these resident bacteria do not like pathogens. Do not like pathogens. Okay? Some of our resident bacteria will actively destroy pathogens for you because they don't want them in their space. I don't want these bad bacteria living next door to me, so I'm going to evict them from your body. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to get rid of them for you for free. That's kind of a good thing. And these resident bacteria make substances called peroxides or bacteriosins, which basically either inhibit, because they inhibit them, or kill pathogenic bacteria. Do you think that is a good thing? It's a good thing. They do this for you for free. They kill bad bacteria for free. That's kind of a really good thing. That's kind of a good thing. This is by far and away the most important beneficial effect that they have. They will what we call outcompete and outperform pathogenic bacteria. They will outcompete and outperform pathogenic bacteria. Let me explain what I mean by that using this slide. Here is your small intestine. Here, on this side, everything is okay and you are protected. On this side, you are not protected. Protection, disease. When you are protected, your natural bacteria literally lock onto the external surface of all of your cells. Can you see that they completely smother the surface of those cells? Literally forming a protective barrier all the way across, which prevents these pathogenic bacteria from actually getting a foothold. They can't physically lock onto your cells. There's a barrier. They form a barrier that prevents that from happening. In a disease situation, because we have got so many more pathogenic bacteria, they start to displace your resident bacteria and lock onto your cells. It is only when they actually displace your resident bacteria that you will start to get that disease. This is by far and away their most important effect. Now, let me just explain something. What do you think happens when you take a shed load of antibiotics to kill a bacterial infection? Because you all know that antibiotics don't kill a virus. They will only kill bacteria. Bingo. When you take antibiotics, they don't just kill these. They may also wipe out a lot of these. So you remove your natural protective layer. As a consequence of getting rid of those, you lose those as well. You are now, for want of a better word, naked. Which means the next bacteria that land on this surface are the ones that are going to colonize it. If they are pathogenic, you will get a disease. If they are your residents, you will not. Has anybody here ever taken antibiotics and then had another infection that follows shortly after? 
One of the reasons is you are killing all of your good bacteria to get rid of the bad bacteria. And then it's a straightforward foot race to see who gets back on here first. If they win, you remain ill. If they win, then you don't remain ill. It's a straightforward race. Antibiotics will very often, if they are non-specific, they will very often kill both, which is why people might recommend that if you are taking antibiotics, you may also want to take what with it. What is a proprietary? Probiotica, Actamel, Yakult, all of these are good bacteria guaranteed to reach your large intestine alive. In other words, what you're trying to do is supplement that to try and prevent them getting a foothold. This is your resident's bacteria most beneficial effect. They literally swamp the entire surface of your cells and protect them from these little devils who want nothing better to attach themselves down here. Do people get that as a concept? Yeah, it's almost like a quilt. They form a protective fleecy layer over here that stops these bad bacteria from latching on. Brilliant. Now, did I or did I not say that you needed to look out for that? Opportunistic pathogen. AKA, when a good bacteria goes bad. This is kind of an important word. Endogenous disease. An endogenous disease, guys, is very simply this. It's a disease that you catch from yourself. Endogenous diseases are diseases you catch from yourself. These are not the diseases that get in through the four portals of entry. These are diseases that you catch from yourself. So the quick question is, how the hell do they do that? Remember I said before, there are certain areas in your body that you do not, repeat, do not allow bacteria to live in. And we call those areas, what, A, ax, axenic. Do you remember? Axenic areas. We don't allow bacteria to live in them. If any of our good bacteria manage to get out of where we allow them to live and get into these axenic areas, they suddenly think, hey, 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 look at what you've been hiding from me all these years, you. This is brilliant over here. I like it over here more than I liked it where you allowed me to live. So what happens with an endogenous disease is that our good bacteria break out of the areas that we allow them to live and they break in to the areas that we exclude them from. And that is very, very risky. Very, very risky. Because disease not may, but often does result from that. Has anybody ever heard of peritonitis? Peritonitis? We have got literally billions of good bacteria that live in our large intestine. If those good bacteria manage to get out of our large intestine and break out into our abdominal cavity, which is axenic, then they are going to cause a major, major problem. And the problem they cause us is peritonitis, a very, very significant and dangerous disease. So how do they actually get out? Very often, these bacteria get out because there is a problem with the large intestine. It may be that you have got Crohn's disease. It may be that you have a perforation of the stomach. It may be that you have had surgery. It may be that you have been stabbed. Or you have a trauma wound. Either way, you have punctured and put a hole into an area where you allow good bacteria to live. What do you think happens if you've been stabbed and you've pulled the blade out? You are letting all of those bacteria out of where you allow them to live into an area that you do not allow them to live. And they go 
haywire on you. They turn bandit on you. They start to colonize, they start to divide, and they start to cause you harm, and they will cause a disease which is called peritonitis, a very significant and serious disease. So yes, this is peritonitis. Can you see all the inflammation and the pus that is surrounding all of your small intestines? All of that yellow material is what we call purulent matter. It's full of bacteria and full of white blood cells battling it out to the death. And yes, here is a puncture wound. And yes, that is poo. And that poo is full of good bacteria. But when those good bacteria get out, they cause this. And that can kill you. Peritonitis can kill you unless it's treated very quickly. Very quickly. So, okay, very often we will use intravenous antibiotics. Why do we put antibiotics in intravenously if there's an enormous risk? Okay, because it's because it's uber quick if you put it in intravenously. Okay. Brilliant. Well done. And that's it. So all you need for this particular section, guys, is do you know what axemic means? Say yes, Dave. Do you know now that we have resident bacteria that live on us? Do you know that we have we limit them to where we allow them to live and we do not allow them to live in other areas? Do you now know the benefits that they give us? Correct. Do you now know when they break out, they become an opportunistic pathogen and cause endogenous diseases? Say yes, Dave. Yes. Thank you so much. In which case, my job here is done.